The story of David and Jonathan is one of the greatest love stories never told. It is in the biblical text, wedged right in the middle of a story about David's life, but it is rarely ever given the attention that it deserves. So today we're going to take a look at it. And I'm going to make the argument that it is in fact a story of David's first and true love. And the loss he experienced would ultimately harden his heart, causing him to grow more cold and distant, eventually leading him down to a path of corruption and murder. It is a love story for the ages. And so it is a story worth telling. So, David and Jonathan, let's learn about it. So to start off, right, we see through the course of scripture that David, at the very least, was bisexual, if not pansexual. Jonathan takes a prominent role in the course of David's story, but David, even later on in life, seems to have a deep desire that could not be satisfied by any one person. I believe, I think the argument can be made, and I will make it, that this this hunger, this longing for connection is to fill the gap that is left in his heart by the loss of Jonathan, but we'll get into that detail a little bit later. But historically we know that David had several wives throughout the course of his rise, uh, the course of his life, but it was in his reign of king that he used his power to do some heinous things. And he used his power he abused it in order to obtain the objects of his desires. I want to touch on one in particular, the story of Bathsheba and her husband Uriah. Uh, and there's a reason I want to touch upon this one. Ultimately, the story goes is that David, as a king at this point, he spots a married woman bathing on the roof of her home one evening as David was outside of the palace on the balcony overlooking the city. So he sees her, he's infatuated with her, so he orders his men to go and to take this woman, you know, this woman who had caught his eye, and bring her to him. Her name is Bathsheba, and it's one of those things in scripture that is so frustrating. We don't actually get to hear from her, uh, which is problematic in a lot of ways. And so the scripture sort of glosses over things, kind of does the yada, yada, yada with a broad brush, but it basically writes, if we read in between the lines, David forces himself on her. Uh, and as king, she had no right to refuse his advances. The story is especially tra tragic because David not only rapes Bathsheba, but impregnates her. And so he tries to cover up his crimes. And he does it in a really horrific way. He summons her husband Uriah, who is a soldier under David's command in the army. He invites him to the palace, gets him drunk, and tries to tell Uriah that he should go back to his house and go sleep with his wife, uh, hoping, David, is that he can pass off the pregnancy as Uriah's child instead of his own. But Uriah refuses. Instead, in solidarity with his brothers in the army who aren't able to return home to their loved ones, right, Uriah refuses to go home to see his wife when his brothers in arms aren't able to see their families. So, so David's plan doesn't work, so he has to resort to a much more diabolical one. He writes up an order to his commander in the field, essentially instructing that Uriah would be put at the place of the most intense fighting. Then, as the battle gets underway, they are to withdraw the rest of the troops so that Uriah gets overwhelmed and killed. And to top it all off, David sends Uriah back to the army with those sealed orders in his hand, essentially causing Uriah to carry his own order of execution 
to his superior officer. The commander does exactly as David asks, and yes, Uriah is killed in battle. Afterwards, David marries Bathsheba, and she gives birth to one of his sons. It's important to note that not everything goes well for David, right? Karma does catch up to him down the line, but that's a story for another day. And the reason I want to tell this story about David and Bathsheba first is because while the story we're going to be talking about today with Jonathan is much more beautiful and touching, I want to emphasize, right, the, the content of David's character. He is not a perfect person, and in fact, he wasn't even a good person by most moral standards. But it is precisely of his imperfections and his knack for making selfish decisions that hurt the people around him that put the story of David and Jonathan into greater perspective. See, I believe that the love and the loss of Jonathan was entirely possible, right? It is entirely possible that that loss was the moment that would come to define David as losing Jonathan sent him into a spiral that would end up resulting in his corruption and ultimately through doing those actions that would be so heinous like the story of Bathsheba and Uriah. I think the loss of Jonathan fundamentally shaped David's character and he would never be the same. Now, the story of David and Jonathan can be found in its entirety in the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel, as they chronicle David's rise from a lowly shepherd boy into the one of the most well-known kings in biblical history. The books are worth a read in their entirety. It's pretty good storytelling, but at the very least, I hope you at least skim along until you start to see the story of David and Jonathan begin to unfold. Because we're only going to look at a handful of specific verses, but the whole thing in its entirety is a beautiful story of love and loss. So, let's set the stage, right? There are three main characters here that we need to focus on. The first is King Saul. King Saul is the first king of the Israelites, and he was chosen to be king, and this is no joke, because he was a head taller than anyone else. That was the reason. That was his qualifications, right? Saul serves as the man and main antagonist in the story of David and Jonathan because once it is decided that Saul was not worthy to be king, and in fact David should be the one to inherit the throne, Saul does everything in his power to try to kill David. Before that takes place, however, David actually works under Saul as one of the chief musicians. You can sort of picture David as one of those pretty boys that would make your heart flutter with an instrument in his hand. So that's Saul, right? The second person we need to take a closer look at is David. At this point in the story that we're focusing on, David is about 18 years old. That's the age he was when he first meets Jonathan. Now immediately prior to their first fated encounter, David had caught Saul's eye and had risen to notoriety among the army and the general populace after slaying Goliath. You know the story, David and Goliath, right? That massive Philistine. Immediately after this takes place, immediately after David kills Goliath, Saul sends for David and wants to know who he is. What is his story? What is his upbringing? And it's in this exchange that Jonathan enters the picture. Jonathan. The very first time we hear about him is in this text in 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 through 4. Here it is in full. And this is a translation in the NRSV, right? When David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. 
And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that he was wearing and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. That is an incredible piece of scripture right there. This is immediately after David has made waves in the kingdom, killing Goliath. And what I think happens here, and it's something that I don't think we can gloss over, is that essentially what we are seeing is a marriage ceremony in everything but name. There's only one other time in the Old Testament where a marriage ceremony is described in any detail, and that is in the book of Ruth. But here, here I think we see it described in just as much detail. I believe in this moment we have a wedding ceremony, or at least the equivalent taking place between Jonathan and David. Just look at the text, right? The soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. That is intense. And while most biblical scholars will argue that it was supposed to be a platonic love, I'm not convinced. The Hebrew word for bound, right, is from the root kashar, which means to tie together, to knit together. It is the physical joining together of two separate things. And it's this physical aspect of this word, right? This physical tying together that is representative of an act of physical intimacy. It's used elsewhere in the Old Testament, and it's frequently in relation to physical objects being tied together tightly. More than that, the, the Hebrew word for love here is important. It's uh, ahab. And it is the word for love, right? But where else is this used in the Old Testament in this form? In Genesis 2467, where Isaac takes Rebekah as his wife, and he loves her. In Judges 16.4, when Samson falls in love with Delilah. Or in Esther 2.17, when it talks about how much the king loved Queen Esther as his wife. Even the prophet Isaiah uses it in chapter 57, verse 8, when he describes Israel as an unfaithful partner who has opened their wedding beds to strangers. Right? These are just a handful of examples. There are so many more where that came from. So I think to claim that it was just a platonic love between these two men, it negates these other possibilities, these other examples in the Old Testament where this love was certainly certainly more intimate. And while the love is present in the text, I believe it is elevated to the next level, to the point of this mock wedding ceremony, because of what happens next. Just look at the next verse, right? Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. What does that sound like to you? It sounds an awful like, lot like the wedding rites that are stipulated in Genesis 2.24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his partner, and they shall become one. David essentially is no longer of his father Jesse's house because he's been brought in, married, into Saul's own home. This makes sense politically as well, as Saul would want to take David's fame and notoriety to boost his own position, his own reputation in the kingdom and among the people. Who doesn't love the story of a hero being rewarded for his efforts with the love of the king's own child? I think this is reinforced with the use of the Hebrew when Saul took David, right? The word in Hebrew here is lakach, and it appears elsewhere in the scriptures when Lamech takes his wives in Genesis 4.19, or when Abraham takes a wife in 25 verse 1 named Keturah, it's used in a similar way in Genesis 38.6, when Judah the father takes a wife named Tamar for his firstborn son, heir. The parallels here to Saul, especially in this last one, and Jonathan are uncanny, right? But even still, even still, that's not where this ends. The evidence, I believe, continues in that very next verse, 
Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that he was wearing and gave it to David and his armor, even his sword and his bow and his belt. Jonathan, who was probably around 10 years older than David at this point, makes a covenant. A wedding covenant, I believe. This covenant of true love, and he seals it by stripping himself naked. He offers everything that he has, in essence, his very life, his body, his soul. He gives it to David. So I believe what we have here in this passage is one of the very first wedding ceremonies described in Scripture. David, after gaining renown for his feats against Goliath, is summoned by King Saul, who takes him to be the husband to his own son, Jonathan. That's what Judah did with his own son, Aaron in Genesis, remember? So, so the practice of choosing a partner for your child, it's, it's not as uncommon as you might think of back then. But in this time and circumstance, it's a happy occasion because Jonathan falls head over heels in love with David. You can see that devotion, that love written throughout the course of the scripture. And so then scripture goes on and it chronicles the ups and downs of David and Jonathan's relationship over the next 15 years, including grief and intimacy. King Saul grows jealous of David and his popularity amongst the people, and he just keeps trying to kill David over and over again while Jonathan rescues David in various ways. Jonathan ultimately betrays his own father and his family by hiding David, and he even intercedes and convinces his father to let David live. And it's important to note that we know David loves Jonathan as well. I think we see such strong evidence for that in 2 Samuel, in the lament that David sings after Jonathan is killed in battle. It's heartbreaking, especially 2 Samuel verse 1, chapter 1, verse 26. The musician David gives voice to his grief in the only way he knows how to through song. He says, I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. To be sure, the relationship between Jonathan and David was special. It was intimate. And it's not as though we're the first ones to consider it to pass the boundaries of platonic love. In a lot of ways, Jonathan and David have become icons in the religiously inclined LGBT community. Their story has inspired things from musicals, there is an actual musical, to poetry, to art, to iconography. Uh, and if you want a good book that covers sort of the, the uh, evidence in the scripture and breaks it down in a more scholastic way, I'd recommend Jonathan Loved David homosexuality in biblical times. It was published in 1978, written by Thomas Horner, who is an Episcopal priest with a doctorate in religion from Columbia University and Union Theological Seminary. Uh, as far as other inspiration goes, right, I, I'd lift up the poem, The Meeting of David and Jonathan. Uh, it was written by the 19th century English poet, John Addington Simmons. This is what it says. There by an ancient holm oak, huge and tough, clasping the firm rock with gnarled roots and rough, he stayed their steps, and in his arms of strength took David, and for sore love found at length solace in speech and pressure and the breadth wherewith the mouth of yearning winnoweth hearts overcharged for utterance. In that kiss, soul unto soul was knit, and bliss to bliss. Beautiful, right? The love between David and Jonathan was 
so powerful, so transformative for so many people. It's made its way into religious iconography. Uh, there is a brother, uh, Robert Lentz. He sort of created this masterpiece, this icon that depicts Jonathan and David. But unlike other ones, Lentz shows Christ above them, blessing their relationship, something that I believe is incredibly beautiful. Now, to be sure, right, there are valid arguments against the intimate relationship between Jonathan and David, but I don't find them particularly convincing. Yes, it is true that Saul tries to marry David off to his daughters uh, in Scripture as a move to try to retain power in the kingdom, but I think that just makes sense because Saul needs David to provide an heir, something that Jonathan and David cannot do alone. What's more, David continues to reject Saul's proposals to marry his daughters. And that might just be because his heart was already devoted to another. Regardless, the relationship between the two, whatever it is that you might think of it, is far more complicated than many of us would first believe. And it shows David and his capability of love and intimacy long before he became corrupted by power, before he turned into the abuser especially to the people closest to him. In contrast, right, hold up these two relationships. In contrast to his exploits against Bathsheba once he was older, right, this younger David in the story of Jonathan and David retains much of its innocence and integrity, which makes this love between him and Jonathan even more extraordinary. Now, there's certainly no way to ever know for sure but I'm of the belief that it was after losing his first true love, Jonathan, that David was never the same again. Just his personality in scripture changes. His heart becomes colder. He becomes more warped by the power that was entrusted to him as king. Maybe his time with Jonathan were the golden years of his life, taken from him through the injustice and violence of war. This is why I believe that David and Jonathan's story remains one of the greatest love stories never told, especially in the Bible. It not only serves as a stark contrast to David's eventual corruption, but it provides us a description of a wedding ceremony, which is sorely lacking in other biblical texts. But in the end, what you read into David and Jonathan's relationship is ultimately your choice. But for me, I will see it as a young, pure first love between two men, two young men in the prime of their life, who due to the tragedy of war were separated by death before they could live out their lives together. Well, to me, that is a story worth telling. So until next time, friends, amen. Hey everyone, thank you so much for stopping by the channel. If you'd like, we'd encourage you to subscribe, turn on the notifications so you know when the next video comes out. Check our video of the week to take a look at something that you can reflect upon. Check out our Facebook page, check out the other links below as a way of staying engaged in the community. Until next time, take care of yourselves.